So already at this point in your view, uh, bin Laden has this sense of himself as far beyond what his uh, uh, outward stature would appear to entitle him to, that he has a vision of himself at some sort of leadership level that really goes far beyond his accomplishments or what one can point to. How do you account for that? I think the major way to account for why he has, if you will, an inflated um, uh, portfolio of his own importance is the, the way in which he had succeeded or, or remembered, thought that he had succeeded in Afghanistan, and then to come back and, as you said, to, to not be engaged, to not have anything to do. He had minor tasks with the Bin Laden Construction Company, but not anything that put him in the forefront of fighting on behalf of Islam, on behalf of the Muslim Ummah. And so then when the, when the major moment came up of the decision the Saudis had to make, do they let the Kuwaiti um, um, take over, the Iraqi take over Kuwait stand, or do they oppose it? And the decision was made to oppose it. Who was going to help them because they couldn't do it on their own? Uh, at that point that, it, that the arrow moves to the U.S. and the U.S. is invited in, bin Laden feels that he's been betrayed, but not as in bin Laden and not as somebody who represented the Arab Mujahideen in Afghanistan, but as somebody who stands in for the entire Muslim Ummah. And the first group he takes on is the Saudi religious authorities. He says that they are the ones who have to authorize it because, as you may know, and your readers and listeners should all know, that what happens, of course, in, in Saudi Arabia is the government does not act until there's a fatwa, until there's a juridical decree from the highest religious authority. And that mufti, his name is Bin Baz, had to give permission for the Americans to come in and support the Saudis in trying to evict the Iraqis from Kuwait. Very delicate, because Muslims fighting Muslims against other, with Muslims against other Muslims, and allowing a group that's non-Muslim to support them in that effort. So the fatwa was very judiciously framed. For bin Laden, it was all charade. And some of his earliest messages are to say, you feckless, you pusillanimous, you uh, non-loyal uh, Muslim ulama, you have betrayed the ummah and I'm now going to call you out. So his first target, if you will, in, in the statements that he begins to create, his first target are the Saudi religious authorities for betraying the purity of the cause, and of course the Saudi government uh, for allowing the infidels, that is to say the Americans and the non-Muslim forces, to come into Saudi Arabia, this holy land, and use this as a staging area for beating back uh, the Iraqi army. Not only was that true, that, that he, he saw this as, 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 as the first moment of his having to, of, of his opposition, not against the Soviets and not against uh, those who were outsiders, but against insiders and with the religious and political cabal or alliance of the, of the Saudi elites being his opponent. I think he would have stopped there had he not been evicted from Saudi Arabia. In other words, there was a sense within Saudi circles that he had gone far enough in his criticism, that he was bold or, if you will, uh, foolhardy, reckless enough in his, in, in his criticism that he had to be expelled. And so he's expelled from Saudi Arabia and he went to the Sudan where, again, I have to emphasize the fact that he had ties through the bin Laden construction company. Sudan was not unfamiliar territory to him. Hassan al-Turabi, who is a major figure in modern Sudanese uh, history, is a very highly educated person, trained in the Sorbonne, Unlike bin Laden is not a religious autodidact, is somebody who really knows a lot about all the sources of both possible and actual interpretation of the Quran, Hadith, and Islamic history. And Tarabi says, welcome, welcome back to Sudan. We'll let you have a farm outside, far enough outside Khartoum that you won't cause us trouble, but we'll allow you to operate out there to do what you want to do. And bin Laden from all records seems to have had a very successful transition from Saudi Arabia, from Jeddah, to this farm which he uh, bought, where he actually uh, reassembled many of the people from Afghanistan that he could not bring back to Saudi Arabia, reassembled them in the Sudan, and seemed to be trying to figure out where next to go with his movement. So while he's in Sudan, he's simultaneously organizing some kind of a resistance force, and he's also a businessman as well. He's actually doing business projects, if I understand, while he's there. Uh, this, at some point, though, puts him afoul, his organization of the resistance movement puts him afoul of the Sudanese government. And well, there's a point at which, I'm sorry, that go ahead. He's, he, his welcome is no longer very warm uh, in the Sudan. The major moment, I think, when his, 
when he wears out the welcome and the welcome mat is turned over and removed, comes at the moment, and it's in 1994, that the president of Egypt, Hosni Mubarak, is visiting, actually Ethiopia, not Sudan, is visiting Ethiopia, and there's a serious assassination attempt. Um, I've read accounts of it, doesn't really matter, but it was close. Uh, any assassination attempt is, is, uh, is undesirable, especially if you're the target. But in this one, it was very close. And what happened, as nearly as everybody can tell, is the Egyptian authorities said to the Americans, we can't tolerate this. We can't tolerate this. And we have to both put pressure on the Sudanese. And the Sudanese had lots of connections to both Egypt and the United States. They yielded. They yielded and said to bin Laden, you, you know, you're no longer welcome. The, 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 the trail is pretty clear that you had a hand in wanting to assassinate uh, Mubarak. Uh, you have to leave. And it was ironic, in hindsight, that his eviction from Sudan, where he was, if not tracked, at least within an orbit of influence from the Egyptians, from Americans, and even from other Sudanese, the people knew about him, to going back to Afghanistan because he couldn't go any other place. Mm. He tried several places, several Muslim countries, even a couple non-Muslim countries. Nobody would take him, and so he goes back to Afghanistan. And when he moves back to Afghanistan, the next layer and the next chapter of his life unfolds.